So uh, we're talking about broadcast performance, and um, if you don't know me, and most of you do, I'll introduce myself again because it's also being recorded. Uh, my name is Andrew Wilson. Uh, my wife and I have had Westview Digital for 20 years now, uh, which is a local production company. Uh, we do a lot of um, uh, TV commercials, corporate videos, training videos, marketing videos, all sorts of stuff. Um, when we're not doing that full time, we also teach uh, at Castleton. Um, I'm teaching an intro to video and film class, uh, video magazine workshop, a couple animation classes, um, an intro to graphic design, and you do. All the rest of them. The rest. <laughs> Public relations, intro to com, media writing, broadcast performance, media and society, um, special topics in public relations. I don't know. There we go. I, that's about it. Broadcast performance <laughs> being the important one for tonight. Yeah. Which is what the presentation is actually named yeah. after. Um, I, so we do a lot of TV commercials. Um, I, I know some of you are kind of come from the narrative background and storytelling and movie making and acting and theater. The bulk of my work, what I do at Westview, is, uh, is, is TV commercials and sort of documentary work. So not a whole lot of narrative. Um, I've got some experience doing that um, uh, over my previous Westview years at Edgewood working with Dave, um, making movies. Uh, but for the most part, um, I'm making a lot of TV commercials. And I'm making TV commercials uh, on your typical Rutland, Vermont budget, which is none. So we never have a lot of opportunity to hire professional talent. So I thought the way that I would approach this tonight is talking about um, working with non-professional talent um, in front of uh, when you've got non-professional camera uh, talent in front of the camera. How can you make them more effective uh, from sitting back behind the camera? Um, I wanted to start this uh, with a commercial that we did several years ago. Um, with some of the most unprofessional talent I've ever worked with in the past. <laughs> and the co-op, we believe insurance is too important to make to companies that treat you like a number. We're owned by our members, and we're committed to protecting you through local agents who understand your needs with unmatched claim service and affordable rates. I'm a member. I'm a member. I'm a member. I'm a member. At the co-op, I'm a member, not just a number. Co-op insurance, member owned, member committed. There you go. Uh, the one time in some 20 odd years I actually agreed to be in front of a camera. Um, and actually my son shot that when he was eight. Yeah, yeah he think, shot the footage. I think Steven <laughs> shot that stuff when, I, when he was eight. Um, the other quick example uh, that I want to show you again was a uh, commercial uh, that we did for Autosaver Group. Um, a couple years ago. Um, the reason I want to show this one is because Autosaver Group sometimes has the budget to hire actors and, and, and talent and those types of things. Um, so I guess the, what I want to challenge you with is can you find the real actors, can you find the real people, and can you find, um, let's see, the paid actors, the unpaid volunteers, um, and the stock footage. There are more than 25,000 square miles in Vermont, New Hampshire, and upstate New York. But with 11 locations, there's an Auto Saver Group dealership near you. We have thousands of new and used vehicles to choose from at the best prices. And if you can't get to us, we'll deliver your vehicle right to you. From Bennington to Derby, Vermont. Littleton to Newport, New Hampshire. Montpelier to Springfield to St. Johnsbury. And everywhere in between, over 450 we strive for 100% customer satisfaction. And when you shop at autosavergroup.com, you can do it from anywhere in your world. Our promise is to continue what we do best and get better at it every day. That's why we see people come back to us generation after generation. And we treat them like an extended part of our family. Your business is a big deal to us. We're the home of the big deal and the best prices we So it's a bit of a joke because um, anybody know? Um, so the only paid actor in this commercial is this guy and his son. <laughs> um, and I believe they came up from Boston to be in the commercial. 
and I was <laughs> shooting the commercial, and we were way behind, and I thought that they were volunteers, uh, actual customers who came and volunteered their time um, to come be in the shot. And we kept putting them off and putting them off and putting them off to the end of the shoot day. And the guy was like, well, I don't care. I'm, being, I'm getting my day rate. Um, uh, so I stopped feeling bad because we literally <laughs> paid him to um, spend an entire day, drive two and a half hours with his nephew and, um, uh, and, and go point in a car for, for, for three seconds. So these are the paid actors. Uh, and then finally um, was a uh, commercial where we actually did hire um, two actors. Maybe you can see a difference. I don't know. I think it's a fun commercial. This woman just bought a car from an auto saver group dealership for the best price, period. This guy did. She got three years of maintenance, lifetime state inspections, oil changes, and the best price, period. He did. She also got roadside assistance, towing, and a lot more. Up to a $3,000 value on us. He came up empty handed. Remember, if it doesn't have the auto saver group seal, you didn't get the big deal. Um, so I guess, you know, the moral of the story is that the advantage to hiring an actor to bring out is that you can get the exact look and style that you want. Um, you can't have a uh, volunteer uh, who is the daughter of the person who works in the accounting office or the son of somebody who works in the accounting office tell them um, you need to shave and go buy this kind of shirt and look like this and stand here for six hours while I do this over and over and over again. Um, so I guess that's the advantage of having paid talent. So I rarely ever um, have that uh, have that opportunity to have paid talent. But I just want to show you sort of like some of the differences between you know having you know professional actors, which uh, literally I think that Falling Boxes commercial is. I was going through the twelve hundred videos in my Vimeo account today, looking for times that we actually hired real on camera talent actors, um, and that was about it. Uh, finally, I think for the TV commercials, I want to share this and sort of tell the story about, about this commercial. This was a commercial that we did for uh, Patton Oil back when they were here. Um, and they had the, the pink truck um, that, you know, they, they used that truck. They donated some of the money for cancer awareness. Um, and they had a customer write them a letter that said, um, I, you know, I really appreciate uh, what you do, I'm looking for sponsors to ride in the Prouty race, will you sponsor me? Um, I've been a customer for so long and then they asked me about making a TV commercial out of it. Um, and the man who did it uh, was super nice, um, had a great story, had a great letter, um, a huge heart, but had a lot of trouble on, on, on camera. Once the camera like started up, um, uh, you know, the original concept for the for the ad was that he was basically going to sit, you know, stand there and say his message, um, more or less read his letter uh, from memory into the camera. Um, and he did lots of takes. Um, and it finally uh, got to the point where I suggested, why don't you um, read the letter just to yourself um, off camera, and I will... Uh, uh, and we'll fill in the rest with some uh, uh, some bike riding and, and other just general shots. And that was kind of an example of, you know, you've got somebody who's not a professional on camera. You can't give them the script ahead of time and say, you need to memorize this, and this is how we expect you to deliver this. Um, uh, so we so this is what ended up coming out of that one. Which... Dear Pat Noyle, thank you for supporting my recent cancer ride and for all you do in the fight against cancer. We're so fortunate to have a business like yours in our community. Seeing Pat's pink truck on the road in Rutland County has special meaning for me because of your support. I'm Andy Olinar, a cancer survivor and a proud Pat and Oil customer. Pat and Oil, fueling a cure with our customers since 2009. Don't forget, ask with a pink truck. And just to sort of uh, emphasize how uncomfortable he was delivering lines into the camera, um, this last part, we had to break up into two parts because he had trouble delivering the entire line um, all at once. Shot as a wide shot, which is somehow getting to it in a second. Shot as a wide shot, came into the close-up, 
and uh, did the second half of the line. So this. I'm Andy Olinoff, a cancer survivor and a proud cat and oil customer. So the cut to the close up is because, you know, he was uncomfortable enough looking into the camera that he couldn't say, I'm Andy Olinoff of Pat and oil. I can't remember what the line is now. But. So, um, you know, I guess the moral of some of those s s stories there is, um, you know, when you've got people who are um, uncomfortable in front of the camera, um, don't have scripts or lines memorized, have trouble memorizing them, or, or just sort of get uh, choked up and nervous in front of the camera, because it, it happens. This is why I chose this career, so that I can always be on this side of the camera, except now. <laughs> um, because I, I feel the same way. I'm behind the camera and I tell people, come on, this is easy, just do it. Maybe I don't make people as comfortable as I could on the camera, which is why I have her own shoots. He brings me along when he can. I'm sort of the, the softy who gets people comfortable and talks to them and asks them about their kids and their dogs and the <laughs> whatever it takes until they feel slightly comfortable to talk to somebody. And, and often when we're, if you, ha if you have more than one person on the shoot, He'll just, um, you know, put me off to the side of the camera so that, you know, they have someone to, to look at that they've felt comfortable talking to. Instead of looking at him and looking, you know, emphasizing the fact that the camera is right there staring back at them. So sometimes we do that too. We just create a person for an eye line and for a <laughs> comfort line, a phone a friend, if you will. So most of the time when I'm doing commercial work, um, they're looking right into the lens. Um, and I'll look right in the lens now and say, it's a relatively difficult thing to do, is look right at the lens without glancing away um, and get a good, solid message in there. So I guess my advice for that is that if you end up with somebody who uh, you're trying to get some direct address out of, which is somebody speaking directly into a lens, um, is as much coverage as you possibly can get. Um, you know, have them do it once in a super wide shot. Have them do it again in a medium shot. Have them do it again in a tight shot. Um, have them do it several times. Um, uh, record them without them knowing that you're recording them uh, and pretend like it's a rehearsal. I don't recommend recording people without telling them, but you always have to tell them afterwards. You can't yeah. ever legally record somebody without telling them. So the key to this is um, multiple coverage. Um, don't be afraid to break lines up. Uh, in half as long as you've got something to cut and edit to. Um, my background is production and post-production um, and editing. Um, where Steph will talk more is uh, her experience is much more live television um, and things that happen live. So I have the uh, uh, luxury of dealing with people who I can tell them to do it again and again and again until I know that I have the coverage um, that I need. And usually it's just a matter of uh, uh, getting in the relax, trying to have a fun work environment, um, and, uh, and if they really can't do it, then, then, then break, up their, uh, uh, break up their material as much as you can, getting them to comfortably do it. I guess that's my sort of advice for, for doing, you know, commercial work, and specifically, again, what I call direct address, right into the camera. Um, uh, we have a teleprompter, and I brought my teleprompter with us uh, to use as an example. I rarely use them for, for this stuff um, because it comes across as somebody uh, reading it. If somebody is doing information, um, you tend to lose a lot of the emotion. For a, for, a, uh, for a commercial that's sort of, you know, I'm a reading, I'm a cancer survivor, patent oil customer is not nearly as um, uh, powerful as somebody who can actually uh, say it. It's hard to read a teleprompter without looking like you're, uh, looking like you're reading. Um, the other part of uh, a good chunk of my business is what I will call and I won't play all this. It's an eight minutes short documentary on, uh, is, is documentary work, where we interviewed a bunch of kids about what it's like to go to this private school um, that may end up closing because of Act 46. So I'll let some of this play and then just kind of talk about um, some of the techniques that I'll use if I'm doing you know, documentary or, or interview type stuff. Our old town that we lived in, which was Cornish, 
they didn't support school choice, and I really wanted to go to the school, and so did my little sister, who goes to the same school, and she's in eighth grade herself. And we wanted to, we wanted to go here very, very badly, and we wanted to go here next year and go through all, all the school, go all through all from middle, from middle school to all the way up to, to, to when we graduate. That's what we wanted. So my mom and dad looked for houses that have school choice and is a sending town. If it wasn't for school choice, I wouldn't be here right now. I originally chose to come here because I knew a lot of people who had come here and had very good experiences, and I was uh, able to come here for middle school uh, via school choice. And that really helped me uh, because I'm dyslexic. They were very understanding of how I learned and what I needed as a learner to succeed and that has helped me succeed a lot in my time here. I've kind of always struggled with school. I've struggled uh, to find a place that could help me learn and use my natural talents to my own advantage. It really depends on the person, and that's why school choice is such a good thing, because some people are way more comfortable in a public school, where it's a lot of people, it's very safe to them, and then other people, like a smaller school, where they get, like, you know, like, more attention on them and more singled out. Like it's the pet really depends on the person for what school is right for them. And that's the whole thing about school choice. It's whatever is comfortable for the person. My family decided that I needed to come here for tenth grade, and um, I was very reluctant. I didn't want to come here, but um, now being here and all my years here, I am very grateful that they they made me made that choice for me. It was my choice to come here. Um, I didn't. I, re I really wanted to be in an environment like this because before I was in schools that were really small um, and really big schools stressed me out. They make me not like be able to focus. It's all about how you learn. Like here, I'm doing very well. It's really important for people to be able to choose the schools that they want to go to because it's not always going to be the perfect fit. Finding the right option for you is really important for yourself and for your family because if you're going to school and you're not learning then why are you going to school and if you're not having fun going to school every day and you're not happy then i think that you're not going to learn school each person learns differently and each person wants to learn something different so i think and each school and their curriculum and their education style is completely different and they fit with different students differently um, so I think that families and their children should be able to choose what fits best for them, no matter what. My brother and I, we went to the same school, and he did amazing. He was just the, the you know, down and dirty, get to the get to the work type, and I did terribly. I think that school choice has given not only me but a lot of the kids here a chance to to go to a school or go to an institution that will serve them greatly. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure anybody can get behind that. Every student is different. And it's hard to say that with schools one, one size fits all. I'm sure there are plenty of students that would not feel well here. And that's why there are only 70 of us. I'm sure there are a lot of students that would not feel well at public schools, which is why there are 70 of us here. Because for each of our own reasons, we don't fit well anywhere else. And it's important to leave those options open so that 100% of students get their needs met. My sister is in public school, and that's a really good place for her to be. She really flourishes in public school. She's doing really well right now. I'm very proud of her. Good job. Um, <laughs> I can't say that to her face. I can only say it to a camera. Um, and I think that's, that's why choice is important. I don't think I would do as well in public school as she is doing, and she would not do as well here as she's doing in public school. It allows us to play to our strengths. I think it's important that families... So, um, it's funny, I kept wanting to stop it. I'm like, oh, but that kid said something great. Oh, but she said something great. <laughs> you know, when I, when I sit down um, and do these sort of, you know, I'll call them mini documentaries, you know, the number one key is to try to make the person that you're interviewing um, feel comfortable, uh, that, you know, what they're going to say and... Um, what they're doing, the message that they have is it's going to make a difference if people want to hear their story. You know, a lot of these kids just you know kind of want to be heard. So I've got a little song and dance that I do whenever I sit down with somebody with this. 
Uh, the first question I always ask somebody is, can you say and spell your name for me um, so that I have it so that I can, we want to keep these kids somewhat anonymous, but usually, you know, I'll put their name on the screen. So the first question I always say is, um, you know, say and spell your name for me and tell me why you're here, what grade are you in, why are you being in this video, are you the president of something or other, are you a volunteer, um, are you a parent, do you have a child in the school, are you a superintendent, um, what's the little title I'm going to put on your screen. And the other thing that I always say over and over and over again is anything that I say or ask you the question is not going to appear in the final video. Um, so you need to rephrase the question in your answer uh, a little bit to put everything in context, um, which really helps tell the story while you're editing. Um, I was an editor before I was a shooter. So I will approach all of my jobs now um, as an editor and I'm constantly editing these interviews in my head while I'm listening to them. Um, and I'm always looking for that, that end point or the start of the quote, and I'm always listening for what the end of the quote is, and I'm trying to make sure that there aren't a whole lot of ums and ahs and strange tangents going off in some other direction. Particularly for this, because one thing you'll notice is that I don't have a whole lot of B-roll for this type of footage. And that's kids, you know, talking in the hallway, kids in classrooms, a lot of this is just these long quotes sort of strung together. So I'm always listening for, you know, putting the, putting the thoughts in context. So there are times that I will give them the first sentence that I may want them to repeat if I know that I don't already kind of have it um, sitting uh, in a usable format. And I'm also always listening for the end point. You know, what is, what's the end thought? What's the last part um, that they're going to say? Um, you know, when can I get out of this, this clip? You know, I'm interviewing 20 kids and I'm given, you know, six to eight minutes for a video. It's not a whole lot per kid. Um, so I know that I have to have the sort of quotes um, succinct and quick um, and sort of tell the story that, I, that, I, that, I, that I'm looking for them to, to tell. Uh, as far as making them more comfortable, sometimes I'll have somebody sit uh, off to the side of the camera, tripod sit up right here. I'll put a chair uh, next to the tripod, have a person that they know or a friend of theirs or a teacher um, sit in that chair just so they have an eye line um, that they've got somebody to look at that they're comfortable with. If I'm looking into the camera and watching the shot, I usually apologize and say, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ignore you. I'm going to make sure that my shot's in focus and my audio levels are good and I'll make up some technical reason. Um, and it's because I don't want them feeling like they've got three, four, five people in the room staring at them. Um, you know, I want them to think that, that the stranger in the room that they just met who came, showed up with a camera is more concerned with the, the focus and everything else and that they're talking to a friend um, who is sitting next to them and try to forget that I'm there. Sometimes I'll even walk away. Sometimes I'll just keep my headphones on and just kind of float away or look at it from far away. Um, another trick that I, that I do, and this is even more um, for commercial work where people are where people are performing for a camera. If I'm the only person shooting and editing, and this is why films will have a director and a director of photography, because the director of photography can look to the viewfinder, make sure you're getting the shot, and the director is able to watch the live action and make sure that you're getting the performance that you want. Um, it took me a lot of years to, to stop looking at everything for the viewfinder um, and line up my shot in the camera um, and then just kind of leave the camera alone and then take a step back and watch the action that's unfolding in front of the camera. Um, when you're stuck in the viewfinder and you're looking at real life in a picture that's this big, um, it can be real easy to miss um, people who glance off camera real quick um, or fidget or, or just look the wrong way or just do something awkward. And it's not until you look at it on a screen like this, you're like, wow, I wish that guy, I wish I had noticed that that little kid was staring right into the camera when he was supposed to be acting. And I probably would have noticed that if I just stepped back and let the camera capture and, and watch the action sort of unfold um, in front. So I guess that's another good piece of advice is step away from the camera and let, um, you know, let it capture what you actually see um, and, and, and watch that. But I guess the trick is, is, is getting them comfortable and, and getting the story that you need um, and the quotes that you need 
if I'm working on a project like this and I know what the message is of the project and I know the story that I'm going to tell, um, I know before I walk out the door what the last quote is going to be for the entire video. And if I don't know what it is, I just keep interviewing people. It was funny, I was at a shoot the other day and the guy said what I knew was going to be the final quote and then at the end of it, he looked right into the lens, or looked right at me, or sort of glanced up. Um, and I said, oh, you know, I really want to use that. Can you say that again and not look at me at the end? And he, and he was like, and that's why this is so important to me. <laughs> and I said, I said, that was great. Can you just maybe do that one more time and keep your eyes right here in the lens? And he was like, you know, and that's why this is just so important to me. <laughs> it's like, stop looking at me. And it literally took like five or six takes for me to, no. to get him to, um, you know, give me what everybody was looking for. Um, but, you know, in his own words, I wasn't completely writing a script for him. Um, but I just knew that the feeling and the emotion was all I wanted. And I just had to have him um, finally do it. And he finally nailed it. He just kept staring at the lens mm -hmm. and just, you know, yeah. didn't, didn't go away. That's uh, hard for students, too, because they're always looking for approval. You know, they get to the end and they're thinking, oh, that was probably pretty good. And they look at you, you know, <laughs> they just they want to know that you're going to say, yeah, that was it. You know, it's just it's just seeking approval. Yeah. When you've got yeah. people looking right in the lens, the tendency and you've got somebody standing up next to it wearing headphones and watching it, they'll, they'll tend to they'll always look up. Um, mm -hmm. It's just so, natural. So it's just kind of natural to do that. So it's 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 a matter of sort of knowing going into a shoot and knowing what it is that you want to come out with. Um, and I guess being sure that you have it, um, whether your talent is professional or, or, or not professional. Um, that's, that's the luxury of being able to be in a production, post-production area, is that you, you have the luxury of shooting over and over and over again, multiple takes, lots of coverage, lots of angles. If you're doing narrative work, do the same scene as a wide shot, as a close-up, as a reverse, as a as a you know secondary reverse, um, extreme close up, um, and just get plenty of coverage so that you've got plenty of editing because you'll always uh, want to change. It's fun to be able to shape the performance of editing, but you can't do that if you only got one take from one angle. So, Anthony does a lot of live stuff. Yeah, I do. I'm, you for a I'm not enter entirely sure how that happened. I think. I think it started doing theater, you know, in school and, and liking that. And then um, volunteering here, or first working here and then volunteering here many, many years ago, that started. And any of you who've worked here in, and done a show in the studio, you know that um, you are recording, but oftentimes you just, you just go unless a really big mistake mistake happens right so you just you start your show and and as long as things are rolling along fine you you don't ever stop you just keep going so it's not likely going to be a perfect show um, or if a technical glitch happens you might have to start over again so it's much like live tv in the sense that it just you get going and it and it keeps going you have to roll with it um, so I, I tend to like that i like the energy of that i like to um not know what's going to happen next and uh probably one of my favorite things is is improv these are tina fey's rules of um of improv i'll get number one too um and i love these i like to use this um you want one yes <laughs> i like to use these with my students when we have our broadcast performance class and and this sort of sets up the rules for our entire semester and I always say we're going to use Tina's rules and it's essentially what you do for improv. So it's that idea that um, that whatever situation you end up in with somebody else. And so if you're um, if you're on live television and you have, uh, for example, a co-host and you're, you're bantering with that co-host and that and they say something that you just don't know where that's going, you don't really you don't get it, or maybe you don't even agree, but uh, first off, you always kind of have to agree, like, okay, I'm gonna go down this road with this person, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree to go down this path and see where it goes. So uh, Tina says, so if we're improvising, and I say, freeze, I have a gun, and you say, that's not a gun, it's your finger. You're pointing your finger at me. 
our improvised scene has ground to a halt. But if I say, freeze, I have a gun, and you say, the gun I gave you for Christmas, you bastard, then we have started a scene because we have agreed that my finger is, in fact, a Christmas gun. And, and I like that. I like that idea that, OK, I'm here with you, and it's live, and I don't know where it's going, but I'm going to agree that we're going to go forward with this. And so that's, that's one of the things that I always like to do. So if I have someone sitting with me and um, we're talking about something, I always try to, if it's an interview situation, I try to be prepared. I've done a lot of research. I know what we're going to be talking about. And I know the person that, you know, I know something about the person I'm talking about. Um, so I almost over prepare. And then I have lots of questions. And then I throw probably 90% of it out like when we're actually doing the interview. So I know lots of background information, and I have questions, and I know what we want to talk about. But I always think, this is not me, and this is not my show. This is about the person I'm speaking with. So then I let them lead where it's going to go. And it's usually a much more interesting place that we go than just the questions I would have asked. So if they tell an interesting story, I don't want to be like, oh, but wait, I have this question I have to get to. And then I block off their interesting story and go on to my next question. I always think, nope, I'm going to go, I'm going to agree, and I'm going to go ahead. And we're going to go where this goes. And if we run out of time and I can't get to all my questions, well, then somebody told an interesting story. And I always feel like that's, that's a better place to go. And so I, I try not to make it about me. I try to make it about them and what they're here to say. And then um, so the next rule is not only just say yes, but say yes and. So that's the idea of you. You say yes, and you agree to go where they want to go. And then you add something um, to that. So let's see, what's her example that I like? Um, so if I start a scene with, I can't believe it's so hot in here, and you just say, yeah. We're kind of like at a standstill, right? Now, this happens with interviews sometimes. You're interviewing someone, you ask them a question, and they give you a yes or no answer, and it just stops. And that's why if you've done a lot of research, or you know something about the person, or you know the subject you're talking about, you will know where to kind of pick it back up and, and ask a follow-up question so that you can hopefully get them off of the yes and the no and the one-word one answer. So you don't want to be that person who puts up that wall. So. Um, but if I say, I can't believe it's so hot in here, and you say, what did you expect? We're in hell. So if that were an improv situation, you know, that, that might happen. Like, well, now we're getting somewhere. You know, this is bringing the story along. So you say, yes, this can't be good for the wax figures. <laughs> or if I say, I can't believe it's so hot in here, and you say, I told you we shouldn't have crawled into this dog's mouth. Now we're getting somewhere. Right? So, you, so, so you, you know, you keep this going, not just yes, but yes and. and you, you keep going down that road. Um, so contribute something. Have something Have something to contribute. Don't shut somebody down. Um, and I think about that in an interview situation. If someone is talking with me, and I do this with students, too. Sometimes, um, in, in Burnham, I'm sure you can relate to this. Sometimes a student will go somewhere, and you're thinking, I do not know where you're going with this. Like, this doesn't seem to apply to what I'm talking about. But you don't shut them down. You know, you try to find a little thread. You try to find something where you get what they're trying to say. And, or you'll say, oh, well, that's interesting. Tell me more. Um, and I'll do that whether it's in the classroom or in the studio or in a live interview situation out in the field somewhere. I just try to always um, go where they're going, um, trust them, and try to contribute something to it, and, and never th just throw up that roadblock. Um, I like rule number three, which is to sometimes make statements and don't just ask questions all the time. And, and that may sound counterintuitive if you're in an in interview situation and you stop asking questions. You actually make statements once in a while. But it's not all about, I'm going to ask you a question, give me an answer. I'm going to ask you a question, now give me an answer. Once in a while, you have to contribute a little something, too. And I'll, I'll tend to do that in the form of a story. A short story, hopefully, that's relatable or, you know, uh, just a little um, commentary. We, Tom and I do this in the parade a lot. You know, we'll just, um, we'll ask each other questions, we'll answer each other's questions, we'll talk about what we see, tell a little story, just, you know, contribute something. Don't always act, expect the other person to hold up hold up the whole show. You know, like I, I'm, you know, I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions and you can fill in all of the material and that's, and that's, you know, 
it's your job. I always think it's, it's my job to, um, to contribute something to. And then uh, the last one, and, and this is particularly great for live television, is that there are no, um, there aren't any mistakes, they're just opportunities, right? So if something, if something goes wrong, uh, you just find a way to make it funny or just find a way to um, let people see that you're human or c to connect with somebody, you know, and, and I always tell my students don't, don't stop, you know, particularly if it's, <laughs> if it's a broadcast, oftentimes you have to just keep going. So just find a way to keep going, no matter how painful it is. And sometimes it's very, very painful. Um, but, <laughs> but I'm always behind the camera going, come on, come on, keep going, you know, and, and I'm sure they hate me for that. <laughs> but, but I do, I make, I make them keep going. So, you know, I, I don't know, when I work on Pet Partners with my um, co-host Beth um, from the Humane Society, we know each other really well, so I don't need to make her feel comfortable. Um, sometimes we need to make the dogs feel comfortable. <laughs> but, but usually my co-host, I don't need to, um, to make her feel comfortable. But usually, um, if you have a good rapport, Beth and I do nothing to prepare for pet partners, really, at this point. It's just she brings in who's available for adoption. Uh, we talk about it, and, and it's just like a bunch of ad-libbing all the way through. Um, and I think the only thing that comes through consistently is that we really care about this organization. We really want these pets to be adopted and uh, we really like each other. Um, we have a lot of fun. Um, so, and a lot of times we'll just sit back and let the animals do the, <laughs> do the work. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know that you want to show much of it. Do we have pumpkin yeah, princess so left? That will take you all the way into the new year, 2019. So it's hard There's to she is very gentle, so gentle to be. So big, you're the gentle giant. She's 72 pounds. I love her eyebrows. She has these expressive, furrowed eyebrows, too. Yes, I think this was the last one. Yeah, this was the last one. That's a Dixie. And I know. We are falling in love with her. Well, we'll jump right in and talk, start talking about our dogs. It's very interesting. All of our dogs today have uh, came into whatever shelter, either here or in Texas, as strays. So maybe there's something we can learn about. It was the thing is crazy. We call them tags on our dogs. Yes. So this is Jeff. Jeff. He arrived from Texas, and he's about two years old. He's a lab mix. Uh, he weighs 54 pounds. He's a neutered male, and he is just kind of a goofy fella. <laughs> he's just kind of. He's almost kind of like a big puppy. He's got like these big feet, like he's still kind of growing into himself, yes. so to speak. And um, just very social. Do you want to curry? Is it your pumpkin? Yeah, the funny thing, we were talking about being comfortable or uncomfortable with the camera. Dogs are so funny because they just are totally transparent how they feel about a camera. Andrew will walk in to film a dog, and there'll be some dogs that will just go like this, and they'll start walking backward, or they'll growl, and they'll approach him, and you know they'll be really menacing, and other times they'll just go hide in the corner. And some dogs will just walk right at them with their tails wagging and like smiling at the camera, and you just never, you never know, but you could tell a lot about the dog by the way they react to the camera. Oh, um, this is kind of... Um, don't don't play it yet, but I would say this was a fun challenge this year because every year we do um, the Pumpkin Princess pageant, which is uh, part of the uh, yearly Rutland Halloween parade. And every year we, we have girls that have been nominated by their schools as their pumpkin princess, and then um, they get not someone gets nominated as the pumpkin queen. Um, and we crown the queen at the end of the show. And this year it was decided that we were gonna bring young men in too. Um, so we're gonna have the men um, with the women and asking them the same questions, but all in the same amount of time. So we had double the, the contestants that we normally have, but the production was the same amount of time. So it was the idea of how do we make sure everyone gets equal time and, and that everyone's comfortable and gets their you know, can get their questions answered. And is this the guy who, so. who had the, do you want to start the beginning of no, this interview? Okay, yeah, so maybe just go to the beginning of these two. Well, this is streaming, so I'm not quite sure how, uh, how, how well I'm going to be able to pop into the middle of it. Oh, I see.
So essentially, I just get profiles for every single person, and I have those in front of me, and I have to ask them questions. But um, I don't know how many kids there were this year, maybe six, 15 or 16 maybe. I'm trying to remember how many kids there were overall. And, and you can't memorize every little thing about them, but you try to, to learn as much as you can about them before they, they just keep coming. It's like one comes and then they go off the set and the other one comes and sits down in front of you and you're trying to look at your papers and remember who everybody is. But um, yeah, so if you, saw, if you saw that young couple that was there, um, the young man was kind of nervous and I was you know, trying to make them both feel comfortable. And, and one of the questions I'm supposed to ask is, you know, what do they do for community service? Because that's part of the reason that they're part of this event. And, and the young man said, um, I can't think of anything. <laughs> and then and then he just looked so panicked and so I just said I said I said something along the lines of but that hasn't oh. stopped me from getting involved. That would be part of an inaugural program like this. This is the first time we've had the, the men representing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to have you. It's nice to have both of you here. So um, you just went through your interview with the judges. How did that go? Uh, it was kind of nerve-wracking. No, nerve-wracking. <laughs> well, you've got through some of those questions, and I won't throw any curveballs or surprises at you, so we'll, we'll talk about the same kinds of things, if, that, if that's good. Um, so I was wondering what you're both thinking about doing when you, when you leave high school. Here you are in your senior year. Yeah. Um, um, I'm thinking about serving in the military, maybe doing an Air Force or Army. Wow, yeah. so you want to serve our country. Yeah. And we thank you for that. That's a, that's a big commitment. Um, and what about you, Kira? What are you thinking about? Um, I want to go to college. I, both my cousin and my sister-in-law are lawyers, so I kind of really like that. I mean, I've always been interested in it, and I just really think that it'd be really cool. Fantastic. And um, you're both involved in community service, one of the reasons that you're representing your school. So you can tell us a little bit about what you like to do to, to uh, serve your community. Let's we'll start with uh, Caleb. Um. I don't really remember what I, well, I you know, let me, well, let me ask you about this. I was touched when I read that you raised money for cancer research um, for your best friend. Yeah. My friend had a brain tumor, and uh, I thought I'd, like, help him out, raise money, and then shave my head and stuff. And then, yeah, I raised... <laughs> so, I saved him. I, 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 that is my probably... I, yes, I forgot that I had done that. <laughs> it's it's funny when you when you can throw a line to some you know when you can throw a line to someone who's in it with you, and that's what I think about is the the kind of the yes and you know that was my contribution was to to um, if you could see his face too because they kind of went back to me, but if you could see his face, he was sort of like. I can't remember, oh no, and then and he was like, oh yeah, <laughs> you know, so that always feels good to be able to um, to make people feel comfortable in front of the camera, and, and usually that if you learn enough ahead of time um, so that you could pull up a little fact quickly or something to just throw, throw them a line once in a while, I sure know I appreciate it when people do it for me, because we all get tongue-tied or just lose our train of thought sometimes. I have students who do it for me a lot. You know, all of a sudden I'll be like, uh, <laughs> and they'll remind me where I left off. Um, so it's good when someone can, can throw you a line. And I think that's probably one of my favorite things to do because I like working with the younger kids. And because um, um, sometimes they're just naturals and other times they're just deer in headlights. You know, you just never know what they're going to be when they get up there. And But they're all great by the end. You know, they just all do a fantastic job. And um, But I, li I like the live stuff. I like um, just talking with people and, and making whoever I'm with uh, trying to make them comfortable and trying to make sure that they talk more than I do at the end of the by the end of the broadcast. One of the biggest mistakes you can make as an on-camera talent person is to uh, um, not be familiar with your script. You know, if you have a script and it's loaded in your teleprompter and you're just counting on that, 
Um, that can sometimes be a disaster because if something goes wrong and you don't know your script, um, or even if you have a copy in front of you but you haven't gone through it first, uh, that can that can uh, backfire on you. So I always tell my uh, students, and <laughs> only Ken with you, I'm I'm going to sh we're going to show people what happens when you don't review your script yeah, first. I feel so <laughs> yes. Um, so, so we're going to have Ken uh, show us like not reviewing the script. But since he's so familiar with scripts in general, he's probably going to be a pro. And you know, my little experiment will fail, but that's okay. Um, so okay, I, I just stand up here for a second. so mm -hmm. it's always important to review your script first, to go through it, to look for any words that are unfamiliar, to circle them. If there's a word you're not sure how to pronounce, you'd want to look that up. You'd make a phonetic spelling guide next to that word. And just make sure that nothing's going to trip you up when you get in front of that camera and, and go to deliver the script. So um, this is a little thing I like to do with my students just to illustrate that point. And it also goes back to these um, sheets that I gave you, gave you prior. So, so Ken will give us a little demonstration of that. Sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, sorry. So, so again, you know what I, and I, and I was mostly trying to figure out a technical problem, but you know what we tell people is that when you're dealing with a teleprompter, um, know your script well enough. You should read your script over and over and over and over again, and know how you're going to say things, know how you're going to emphasize, them, know how you're going to pronounce people's names, and and really only rely on this. You know, this is similar to you standing on stage and the difference between memorizing your lines and reading them off of a script and the trick to make a teleprompter work is to not seem like you're reading it and to know it so well that you're having a conversation with the camera um, and to know the script so well that you're having a conversation with the camera and it doesn't seem like you're reading it. Take a breath, look at the camera, smile and action. Good evening. I'm Ken Holmes reporting for the Channel 6 at 6 News. Albany residents were shocked and terrified today when thousands of rubber baby buggy bumpers rose up from under the city streets, tearing up major roadways and sidewalks in mass panic. The rubber baby bugger buggy bumpers careened down downtown Albany for a total of 20 minutes before returning to the, into the earth and disappearing as abruptly as they arrived. Fortunately, no one was injured. The city buildings and streets appeared to be structurally sound, and oddly enough, the only casualties were six, six, slim, <laughs> slim, slim, sycamore saplings. Good evening, I'm Jim Dimble, reporting for Channel 5's Top 5 at 5. Our first top story today, this evening, on our Top 5 at 5 is Toy Boat, Toy Boat, Toy Boat, Toy Boat, Toy Boat, Toy Boat. And coming up, our consumer field reporter, Scaly Hands, will fill us in on the most effective new hand care product on the market. And since, since this is the Top 5 at 5, we'll say it five times. Lemony Limit, <laughs> Lemony Limit, Limit. Lemon, 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 lemon. <laughs> and here's Scaly with that. Here's Scaly with that. Is it not advancing? It's not. Story for you. Thank you, Jim. Yes, Lemon Liniment uh, seems to be the best product on the market right now for dry, scaly hands, and the makers of the product tell us their success can, can be attributed to a very special ingredient. Blue Black Bugs Blood. And one more consumer tip for our viewers. Wilson Leather is having a big sale right now on red leather, yellow leather. And since this is the top five at five, we'll say it five times. Red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather, leather, ye yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather, red yellow leather, yellow, ye red leather, yellow leather. I don't know if I said that the right amount of times, but moving on. Red leather, yellow leather. When you come into Wilson's Leather, make sure to enter their current promotion and take three free throws in their parking lots basketball hoop. That's right. If you make all three free throws, you will win a free red leather, yellow leather jacket. Back to you, Jim. Thanks, Kelly. We were going to wrap up our newscast with a story on Peter Piper picking a peck of pickled peppers, but unfortunately, the reporter missed a flight and she failed to get a ride. Apparently, she shells seashells by the seashore, and the seashells she shells are seashells, and she sold too many, so many shells, she was unable to get a ride to the airport to report on Peter Piper's progress. To wrap up our top five at five newscasts this evening, I'd like to leave you with five things to think about. 
Friday's five fresh fish, uh, Friday's five fresh fish specials. Imagine an imaginary menagerie manager imagining managing on an imaginary menagerie, coming and going, talking and laughing, and we're making the campus come alive. 14.4 cubic feet, frost-free freezer, and finally, a snowflake six-way similarity is determined by essential ice crystals, six similar sides. Please join us at 11 for now. This is Jim Dimball signing off. You did very well. Yeah, <laughs> great. great animation and um, yeah, good, good with your tone and everything else. And you kept your energy. One thing I always say is keep your energy up the entire time, all the way through, because people tend to run out of breath and then they get slower and or or you know they'll speed up. And the only time you did that was when the teleprompter was being a creep, uh, which it did. It wasn't didn't always do what it was supposed to do. Yeah, which goes back to the lesson of. Uh, be prepared, you know, read off of your script if you have to. You might have to abandon the teleprompter altogether. So uh, those are just kind of some of the things we prepare our students for. And I do other mean things too, like I make them stand up in front of a, um, you know, a background of some sort and I give them some quick news, different news stories that are going on and then they have to get up and do a live stand-up report. Um, in front of the camera just to, to practice that. So they pretend they're reporting live from a specific location and they know a few facts about it. And then there'll be some delay and they can't go back to the studio. So then they just have to spontaneously start interviewing people or just repeating what they know. And, and I make them just keep standing there and throwing things at them that they have to you know, adapt to. So um, most of them like that. And then some of them never want to take a class with me again. <laughs> but, but most of them have fun with it. So um, those are the, some, some of the things we do to prepare people for, for being on camera. Just, just sort of like all the things you can't prepare for. You know, so you just have to be comfortable um, with the camera as much as possible, comfortable talking to other people, and more than anything, uh, wanting to make other people comfortable. Uh, when you're interacting with them for the camera, so yeah. So do you sometimes it? overshoot so that if yes. something doesn't <laughs> work, <laughs> you can have some backup? Yeah, I, um, uh, you know, with the exception of you know some of these interview things, um, there are times that I'll be recording interviews, like those documentary stuff, and I'll be thinking I'm not going to use this. I know I'm not going to use this, but I'm not going to turn the camera off because maybe they're going to come out with some gem, like right in the middle of stuff that I know I'm not going to use. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I shoot lots. I mean, that 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 the kid interview stuff was, uh, um, you know, that's an eight minute video, and uh, I think we literally shot kids from nine in the morning until they left at three. Like mm -hmm. It was and it was a parade. It was in and out with maybe ten or fifteen minutes between, um, maybe ten minutes between them. But I, I I probably had four hours of footage for that. Ish. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd shoot way more than I know I'm going to need. Yeah, and same thing with questions. Like if you're going to be interviewing somebody, um, even for these documentaries, you know, you might have ten or twelve questions. Um, you might only get to five, but it's always nice to know, like, what else could I talk to them about? What else might I get? What other angle could I come at it from? And just sort of over-prepare, uh, knowing you're going to toss a lot of it out, likely. But same thing with the footage. You're going to not use a lot of it, but at least you have it. So at the same time, I rarely shoot a television commercial without a solid approved script ahead of time. I, I don't remember the last time I did a sort of, you know, impromptu, improvisational commercial. Those don't turn out so like, well. Yeah, like let's sit down and interview somebody about you know why they, you know, a testimonial. Yeah. Um, you know, we did. Um, I do some longer sort of info sales videos for the hospital that are testimonial based. Um, but what we do is that we approach it. Um, We, when we shoot it, um, three minutes, I doubt it, we'll see. My name is Susan Rawls, I'm from Dorset, Vermont, and I've had both knees and both shoulders replaced. I really couldn't raise my hands uh, over my head. It was very, very difficult for me to even do my hair. Uh, obviously, reach for things, um, and as a result of it, I am 
actually just there's no limits to what I'm able, able to do now and I'm just thrilled. The biggest thing was there was no pain. I mean she'd been in so much pain for so long that when she had her knees done and after the surgery when I was talking to her she said but it doesn't hurt anymore. The first time I went to see Dr. Marsh I was just overwhelmed first of all at how young he looked and I immediately asked him to show me his his all of his um, um, diplomas because <laughs> <laughs> he looked far too young to be able to, to to be in the position he was. I take care of people's quality of life. I'm not a cardiologist. I'm not treating heart attacks, I'm not preventing strokes, I'm not saving lives, I'm not curing cancer, um, but I'm helping people with their quality of life. You know, the thing that, that seriously is is just truly amazing about this is both of these shoulders, I mean, seriously, I could not move either one of them. I, in order for me to do my hair, I would have to bend over, and I'd have to have my shoulders on the side of the sink because I couldn't lift them up. And now I am able to do absolutely everything. It's just, to say it's a miracle is absolutely the truth. It's, I never thought that I would have this range of motion ever again, ever. It's life-changing without question. So that's why my hair looks so good. It's <laughs> good. I do play golf, not well, but um, I, I love the game. And my husband and I are, um, are play quite a bit. Um, after my um, shoulder surgery, uh, we were playing, and it was the first time that I was on the course. <laughs> and um, my husband Chuck could not believe it because um, I got out there the first time with uh, right after the surgery, and I was right back where I was right down the center. She never leaves the center of the fairway, which drives me crazy. She she doesn't see the golf course in nature. She goes down the middle of the fairway, which is terrible. And uh, But she loves it, and she gets her outside, and she's able to, to play well, and, and that's terrific. I am blessed to have a job that allows me to impact patients' lives. Two shoulders and two knees. Look at her. She's getting around without any pain. Two knees being replaced, and Four days later, you're going up and downstairs. Pretty remarkable. I feel very fortunate to have Rutland Regional so close to where we live. So you were asking, you know, when I was talking about having scripts. Susan um, was scripted? No. Okay. Uh, so yeah. She's a good storyteller. Yeah, she is. Very good storyteller. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, you're because I said I rarely go in and do a TV commercial without a good solid approved script and it's pretty rare that I will do a TV commercial that is unscripted interview style like this because it always ends up being a perfect 36 seconds long. Yeah. Um, so, but this is an exception to that and I wanted to play that entire thing for you because what happens now is that I'll produce that for it and the hospital will be like, that's great, it's perfect, now make 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, now make a version that's 30 seconds long. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the 30. My name is Susan Rawls, and I've had both knees and both shoulders replaced. I really couldn't raise my hands uh, over my head. It was very, very difficult for me to even do my hair. She'd been in so much pain for so long that after the surgery, she said it doesn't hurt anymore. To say it's a miracle is absolutely the truth. I never thought that I would have this range of motion ever again. It's life-changing without question. I feel very fortunate to have Rutland Regional so close to where we live. You know, for the commercial work, almost all of it is completely planned and scripted out. Yeah. In my media writing classes, my students will say during the television commercial unit, they'll be like, oh, it's 33 seconds, it's fine. And I'm like, no, it's not. And they're like, oh, well, we'll just technology edit it. I'm like, no, you, can, you can't fix it with that. Like, the script has to be right to start with and has to be the right length. And, you know, you have to start from that spot. And then work with your challenges, but they always think technology is going to fix everything. I'll just edit it, and like, no, it doesn't. No, you can't edit yeah. it after it's. <laughs> and I know why I went off that tangent because you're talking about overshooting. Yeah. Um, and if I have a script, I don't overshoot. I know exactly what I need. Yeah. I know exactly what hour it's yeah. going to be. I know exactly. And you know when gonna, you get the shot. I know exactly where it's going to appear. I know how long it needs to be. Yeah. Um, so no, for commercials, I don't overshoot. But the 
Because many documentary things fall off. I shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. Yeah. Anything else? Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Thanks.